Hi, welcome to a cognitive sciences interview. We have Dr. James Dankert. How's it going? Very well, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd, I'd like to maybe just start with uh, maybe what your history is in the, the sciences and in cognitive sciences, if you could just sort of explain. Sure. Um, I did all my training in Australia. So I was trained as a, a clinical neuropsychologist there. And then I also did my PhD there in, uh, in neuroscience or uh, cognitive neuroscience, um, both at an institution called La Trobe University. And then I, I moved in uh, 1999 to Canada, to um, London, Ontario, to do a postdoctoral fellowship with a guy called Mel Goodale. And the plan was to be there for a couple of years and then return to Australia. But, um, you know, best laid plans of mice and men. I, uh, I met my wife, who's Canadian, right. and I looked for jobs here in Canada because there are a, a range of reasons why we, we wanted to stay here. And I got a job in 2002 at um, the University of Waterloo as a Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience. And those chairs, uh, the, it was tier two, the, the nice. tier, a more senior sort of thing. Um, and those chairs last for about 10 years. And, and uh, so when that finished, I stayed around as a, as a professor in Cognitive Neuroscience here. Nice. And then you, you're running a two-part lab, I read? Right, so we sort of have two main uh, research programs. And so the biggest one, I, I think the one that you're wanting to talk about is about boredom and trying to understand right. um, the experience of boredom from sort of a cognitive and a, a neuroscience perspective. Right. Um, and then the other one is to try and understand, and they, they don't seem like they're related, but I can make the link if you want me to. I would love um, it. The other one is uh, related to how we make mental representations in our mind. So I see. You, everything that's out there in the world, you can't possibly represent everything. There's sort of too much information and it's changing too quickly. So what you need to do is to create a mental model that sort of encapsulates the rules and regularities of how the world works and allows you to act in predictable ways. Right. Um, so I saw you had interested in, you were interested in schizophrenia. So that's where that comes from as well? Uh, not so much. So I'd done uh, a bit of work in schizophrenia many, many years ago. I haven't done it for a long time now. Okay. Um, but it actually comes from the neglect syndrome. So you might have seen that I've done some work with uh, people with spatial neglect. So these are, the, the best way to describe this comes from a guy called Marcel Messilan, who says that you know, people with neglect behave as if the left side of the world has simply ceased to exist. Um, mm -hmm. And people have cast that in the past as a problem with spatial attention. They can't attend to the left side of the world. But I, I think that that only captures a part of the syndrome i think they also have a problem in just updating their mental representations and so we've done a bit of work to, to look into that right yeah that's what i was asking because you said you were looking at the mental representation and then schizophrenia has sort of an issue with the mental representation yeah, so th there are links there too right, right? Um, a, a lot of uh, the sort of things that you you might see in uh, in psychiatric psychotic disorders like schizophrenia are problems that we might say of, of predictive coding Right, so they're not efficiently sort of predicting the sensory outcomes of their intended actions. Um, there's, there's lots of people who do much more detailed and, and theoretically deep work on this than I ever have. Um, but so the easiest example is to think about auditory hallucinations. Okay, and you and I um, can think very easily. We can think to ourselves, and we know that when we're thinking to ourselves, that it's us generating it. That, that we're coming up with the thoughts in our mind's eye. Um, but the patient with schizophrenia might misconstrue that kind of internal thought process, that internal monologue as coming from a different source because they're not predicting that, that sense of agency in it. And so there is that notion of, of prediction, having an accurate mental model that, that um, likely relates to some of the symptomatology that you see in schizophrenia. Interesting. Okay, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about your facilities. Um, how many students and, and researchers are in your, each of your facilities, I guess? Uh, well, so we sort of run it just as a single sort of facility. The mental model stuff I do in collaboration with a colleague. And so we have a couple of students that we co-supervise. In the Boredom Lab, I have uh, at the moment four graduate students and two postdocs. And that's probably about as large as the lab ever gets. Right. Um, and, it, you know, because it fluctuates with time. In fact, one of my students just uh, defended his PhD this week. So we'll go down to three graduate students and two postdocs. Um, we have a lot of facilities here, though. So we, we use... Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging at the local hospital. Yeah, I saw um, that for like $200 a visit or something. It's, about, it's closer to 260, which makes it really, right. really cheap, right? So if you know anything about doing this at, at other facilities, it's closer to 500 or 600 bucks yeah. an hour. 
Um, and so we're grateful for the people at Grand River Hospital that have, uh, have made that partnership with us. Um, but we're, I mean, we're using, I, I like to use functional imaging to, to address these questions of cogn cognition and cognitive mechanisms. We're not, um, we're not at the cutting edge of the tool because we can't be, right? We, we, we don't have, we have a 1.5 Tesla machine, not a three, four, seven Tesla machine that some places have. Right. Um, and, uh, and we also don't really have a neuroimaging group. You know, if you go to a place like Western's Brain and Mind, you know, they have a, a concerted group of people who are developing the technique and we, we don't have that. We have other things available to us. We've been we've, uh, starting to make use of EEG. We've used uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. I'm very interested in looking at psychophysics. So changes in things like heart rate and skin conductance levels as you get bored or as you get out of being bored. Um, so we do those kinds of things. And then a fairly straight kind of, you know, probably aware of mTERC uh, um, studies where we get lots of people online to fill out surveys. We do a bit of that kind of research as well. Um, and then just straight behavioral experiments, the sort of stuff that we've been doing for more than 100 years now, of just getting people in and getting them to do tasks and seeing how they perform. Nice, yeah. So all, all of this is, um, I guess, partly boredom. It's all centered around boredom as your fundamental uh, research uh, topic. That's the primary uh, research program that I run at the moment. Yeah, so it took a while to get that up and running, but yes, that's what we do mostly now. So, what like can you discuss some of your findings over the years? If how how you first maybe saw boredom at the beginning, you first theorized it and first got results, and then maybe how it evolved and changed today. Sure. Um, so there's a lot out there. So yeah. you, know, you can sort of stop me and interrupt me and say you know and, and uh, ask for further explanations if you like. But you ask that in an interesting way you know, where did I start from and, and how have I changed? And I think that's a really good way of asking about science, right? Because, you know, you do start from one place and the data takes you places you didn't actually think it was going to. So one of the places that I started from is this sort of physician heal thyself kind of notion. That is that, you know, I experience boredom a fair bit. I still do, even though I'm sort of in my late forties. Um, and, and I hate it. I, I really can't stand the experience. And so I wanted to understand it more. And I wanted to, to um, use that deeper understanding of what the experience was like to perhaps get rid of it. And I think, oh, wow. now, I'm, I think now I'm content with the notion that there's no getting rid of it. <laughs> but, but the other thing that, that your question or the way you ask your question sort of prompts me to think is, you know, well, where'd you start from? Well, I started from that personal experience. And for me, boredom was a really agitating, restless, aggressively dissatisfying experience. And I think that's a good place to start in terms of the definition because people often think about boredom much more in a sort of couch potato sort of way, you know, that you're, you're bored, you, you can't be bothered with anything, and so you just don't do anything. Um, I, I think that that's a much better description of apathy. And so uh -huh. boredom is actually a state of wanting. It's a, it's a state of wanting something to do, but not knowing what would satisfy. So you, that, and, and that's what is at the base of that kind of, restlessness and agitation. And I think if you go through the literature, the two most uh, common words that go together in boredom literature is boredom and restlessness. So right. me saying this, that it's, it's, a, it's a common sort of theme. And I also like somebody sort of pointed me in the direction of this quote from Tolstoy that's, that comes from Anna Karenina that says that boredom is the desire for desires, right? Uh, um, I really like that quote. And yeah, it is nice. A colleague of mine, uh, John Eastwood, that we're sort of working off of that kind of definition that says that, you know, boredom is this state of wanting, but failing to satisfy a need to engage with the world. Uh -huh. so I also so I started from that point of view of saying, I think it's agitating. So in 2014, we published some work where we looked at the psychophysics of it. And we found that if you made people bored by having them watch a movie of two guys hang laundry for a couple of minutes, um, you, you got a, a rise in skin conductance levels and you got a, a drop in heart rate. And this is not what we expected. We expected if it was an agitating experience, they should both rise. Right. But that that's a pattern known as directional fractionation. So when one goes, one, one of these metrics of psychophysics goes one way and the other one goes the other. Um, and this is associated with failing to pay attention. So in people with ADHD, you get the same thing. They the same thing. Interesting. So the laundry, the laundry video for your control group, I guess, um, was basically doing, doing this effect on them that they, they would just stop paying attention rather than being actually bored. 
Um, well, it's not, I, I don't know. I think they were bored. We had ratings from them that said that they were bored. Um, I think the notion is that they, because they're sitting in an experiment, there's demand characteristics there. They know that they should be trying to engage with the movie, um, but there's just no way that you can because it's just fundamentally uh. boring, right? Um, and so that, that effect has been so partially replicated in other labs and we're in the process of replicating it in our own lab. What we also found in that study was that people were, um, had higher levels of cortisol than, uh, than another group that we'd had watch a sad movie, right? Oh, okay. Now these, these weren't levels of cortisol that you'd associate with being in a state of fear or extreme anxiety. They, they weren't that high, but they were higher than, than being in a state of sadness. And so that also sort of says that the experience was stressful. It was not um, hmm. uncomfortable and, and stressful. Now, if I stopped there, I might sort of say, well, I've confirmed my intuition that I think boredom is this agitating kind of state, right? right. There's a colleague of mine in the UK, a guy called uh, Wynan Van Tilburg, who has consistently been saying that boredom is a low arousal state. It's, it's not high arousal, you know, and, and just, he's very, very confident that it's a low arousal. Right. And your results were high arousal. Yeah. Or That's not right. high, but medium at least. That's right. So, so, um, so what we did next and, and we published this in 2018 was we, we had people read passages from two different books. One was a, a Harry Potter and the other one was about the elements and properties of soil. So, you know, one is supposed to be interesting and engaging and the other one is supposed to be a little bit boring. I'll let your listeners decide which is Right, which. depending if you're interested in soil or not, I guess, or Harry <laughs> Potter. <laughs> I'm interested in soil. So I, I'm not going to suggest that soil is uninteresting to everyone. Um, anyway, so while people were reading these things, we, we sort of did what are called thought probes. So you sort of stop, the, you interrupt their reading every once in a while and you ask them, how are you feeling, right? But you ask them in specific ways. How bored are you? Um, and, you know, and then we asked, how restless are you? So that's sort of getting onto this idea of boredom as an agitated state. But then we also asked, how sleepy are you? And it turns out when you read the boring story second, your boredom levels rise very sharply, your, your restlessness rises very sharply, and your sleepiness rises very sharply. Wow. How do you, how do you reconcile a person saying, I'm really restless, but I'm getting drowsy too. Right? right. So they either don't know themselves or there's something going on there. Yeah, I actually think that, you know, there are problems with self-report, right? But I right. think also whenever reviewers come up with these challenges to self-report, I think, well, if I want to know how a person's feeling, my best avenue is to ask them, right? Right. So in the end, I kind of have to trust what they say. Um, I think what that means is that there's a dynamics at play here. Um, and so maybe when you first start doing something, you, you're trying to become engaged, but it gets a little bit dull over time and your arousal levels dip. Now you're faced with a choice when your arousal levels dip. You either get up and go and do something else, but in the context of this experiment, they really, I mean, they were allowed to from an ethical standpoint, but they really didn't feel like they should. Uh -huh. You try somehow to, to ramp up your arousal so that you can make the non-boring thing at least bearable, or you can at least stay engaged with it somehow. So I think that there's a fluctuation and oscillation between, you know, dips in arousal and then trying to bump your arousal up to stay engaged and so on. Uh, and do you think like their, their feedback is just an average of how they were doing during the time or? I, I mean, I think that, that that's exactly right, but there's probably uh -huh. just not enough sort of uh, um, sensitivity or, or um, you know, a resolution to those measures for us to really pick it out in a temporal right. way. So that's what we're going to do next is sort of try and use some of the psychophysics measures that we have to try and get a continuous look at the dynamics of a bored state, right? Like how does it change with time? And that's, that's the state of boredom. I'm also interested in, you know, people who are prone to experiencing boredom a lot, people who experience it frequently and intensely, maybe they oscillate between high and low arousal just more frequently than the rest of us do. Oh, that interesting. Sort of, it's that kind of living at the extremes that is at the heart of them having problems with boredom chronically. And right. the other thing that's cool about all of this is that um, uh, Wynand Van Tilburg, the guy in the UK I told you about, who, who thinks boredom is a low arousal thing, he and I are in talks at the moment to do what kind of amounts to an adversarial collaboration, right? So we, we're going to try, we have a student that's going to work on looking at the dynamics of boredom and, and sort of try and definitively address this question. So looking forward to seeing how that pans out. Fascinating. Yeah. And did, how, were you able to get um, like actual data from an EEG or from the MRI machine you were talking about regarding boredom? 
Yeah, so we've done some, so we've done two MRI studies, one, one just a replication of the other, and the, the replication is published on Psych Archive, because I haven't bothered really to try and get it up anywhere else, but people can see it and they can have the data and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so again, we used our video of, of a couple of guys hanging laundry. We also had a BBC Blue Planet video. We had just what's called a resting state scan. So people just look at a cross for eight minutes and do nothing. And then we had a, a sustained attention task. And there's a, a network of the brain known as the default mode network that is active or more active when you don't have an external task to do. Mm -hmm. So something like daydreaming or, um, uh, or sort of, you know, uh, thinking about what you have to do, you know, after our interview today, thinking about what, you know, what you're going to do for the rest of the day, those kind of internal thoughts that you have that don't have any external marker that is attached to them, right? Right. Sometimes called task unrelated thoughts, sometimes called, you know, mind wandering and these, these kind of things. The default mode network is more active in those instances. And what we found is that in the resting state, you see the default mode active um, and we wanted that as a kind of control. In the, the boredom movie induction, you see the default mode network active because even though there's a movie of two guys hanging washing that you're supposed to be paying attention to, it's so dull that you can't pay attention to it and you're disengaged from it. Uh -huh. um, and then the default mode is downregulated when you're watching the interesting movie. So when you're watching BBC's Blue Planet, you, the default network shuts off and central executive and attention networks keep um, So the only difference then between the resting state scan and the boring scan was that we found that there was what we call anti-correlated activity in the anterior insular cortex. What we mean by that is that when the default net network was active, the anterior insular was deactivated, sort of up and down together. And the, insular, the anterior insular cortex is an important part of the brain that's for a range of different things. People are really starting to pay a lot more attention to it than we did 20 years ago. And it's a part of that's important for what we think is sort of representing salience, representing things out there in the world that are of interest or importance to you from a behavioral standpoint. So what we think is happening in our boredom scan is that you, there's something out there, there's something external to pay attention to. So it's not like, you know, uh, um, sort of internal thoughts where you're thinking about the past or you're thinking about your, your future. There's a movie there, you're supposed right. to be paying attention to the movie. Um, but you can't because it's just mind-numbingly boring. And so you downregulate this part of the brain that would normally be important for you to engage with an external device or an external event. Um, and there's another study that came out recently, the guys called um, Delmas and Whitman are the, the uh, authors. They did a really cool thing where they, they had people do a boring task, they had them do a challenging task, and then they just had them do a task that said, you know, do you like this or not like it? Or how much do you like a thing? That, that's interesting um, about the I'm, task too, because that's a big, huge contrast. Like when you are actually doing a task and your mind could wander, you don't have to focus on the task. Yeah, that's a big difference. It is a big difference. But the, the cool thing that they did in their study was that they said, after you've done these various sorts of tasks, they said, how much money would you pay for a music download? Right? And the idea here is that if I get you really, really bored, then you, you're more likely to pay more money for the music download, which is exactly what they found. So wow. when, when you do the boring task, then you shell out more dollars for, for a download. What they found was that activity in the anterior insular cortex was related to how much money you wanted to pay to get out of being bored. Huh. And so that part of the brain is really important for engaging, successfully engaging with the world. And, and uh, so I think we're at, we're at really early stages of doing neuroimaging work on boredom but there's some really cool stuff out there. Nice. And I saw you were also doing some stuff with tracking eye movement and where eyes look. Uh, so we, we um, I'm not sure which work you're sort of referring to there, but we're interested in looking at that in terms of pupil dilation. We haven't published anything on that just yet, but the okay. pupil dilation will tell you something about regulation of neurogenergic systems, which are important for arousal levels. So it's just going to be one other metric that we use to try and look at changes in arousal over time. Uh -huh. um, we have done, I've done studies on eye movements for reasons, but not yet for, for uh, boredom proneness. Oh, not for boredom. Okay. But for other reasons. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so where, where do you think you're going to take this uh, research in the future? Are you going to look more at the brain scans or... Yeah, I, so there's a lot of things that are going on at the moment. I, I think that the best, the thing that keeps me engaged in the research that I'm doing <laughs> is you, you attack it from different angles, right? Yeah. So 
Um, I'm collaborating with some social psychologists at the moment um, where they have concepts of, that they talk about in terms of self-regulation. Um, and, and so we're doing some interesting things there that is just looking at the relationships between different sort of personality traits and boredom proneness. Right. One of the things that we're really interested in, and we're just on the cusp of trying to publish this, is the, the relationship between self-esteem and boredom. Oh. It seems that um, you know, lower levels of self-esteem will predict boredom in the future. So um, if, you, if you sort of feel like you're not really an effective agent in the world, you know, when you try to do stuff, it doesn't work, right? And so, or you don't, you don't succeed in achieving your goals in the way that you would like to succeed. If that sort of impacts on your self-esteem, then you're more likely to be bored with the world in the, into the future. I think that's a really interesting sort of finding. So we're huh. right at the moment and trying to, trying to see where, we'll, where that takes us. I am still interested in the uh, um, brain imaging sort of stuff, but moving more towards EEG. So there's a, run, a range of different things that we'll do in terms of the brain. So EEG is one of them, and we have data from a colleague at Brock University, uh, which is near Niagara Falls. Um, and, and she has this data in 10 to 15 year olds where they have a lot of EEG data. And she's asked us to have a look at it in terms of boredom proneness. And so we look at power in different frequency bands. So we're looking at posterior alpha and mid frontal theta. Um, and whether or not that is modulated both with age, um, as people get from sort of pre-teen to teenage years, and also by boredom proneness. So we're just at the, on the cusp of analyzing that data, which I think is really cool. And we're gonna replicate that data, at least, or at least conduct that same sort of experiment with the same tasks again in adolescence to try and get that sort of full age range of, of uh, um, boredom proneness and EEG um, as, as a marker of boredom. Um, as I said to you before, I'm interested in looking at the dynamics of it, right? I think boredom, it's, it's not a static, it's not like any other emotion, or, or, and it's not just an emotion, but like any other feeling state, it's dynamic, it changes over time, right? Right, um, yeah, and you were talking about the fluctuations between states, and yeah. Yeah, so I'd be interested to try and, and, and probe that a little bit more in detail to try and understand, well, how does it, in what ways does it fluctuate over time? And again, you know, I haven't, most of my research hasn't really focused on the state, of boredom, but more the personality trait of being prone to experiencing it. Because I think yeah. the, Go ahead, the trait is, you know, so, so I was just gonna say that the trait is more important to me because it's the trait that is associated with all of these other negative sort of outcomes, right? Uh -huh. um, and, and what trait boredom proneness sort of says to, to me is that a person who suffers from boredom a lot is just not really adaptively responding to the state signal. And so I want to understand more about why. We've also got some, uh, we, we've got some transcranial direct current stimulation stuff planned. So there's some fairly, you, you don't get much spatial resolution with that technique, but there's some fairly interesting ideas about what the left and right frontal cortex might do in terms of engaging with the world. So fairly broadly that the right frontal cortex might be more important for novelty seeking. And of course, people who are prone to boredom might seek out more novelty than those who are not. Um, and so we can use this technique to disrupt functioning in frontal cortices and, and see whether or not that increases boredom or, or, or not. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so those kinds of, of studies are the sorts of things that we've planned and that we're interested in. And, and then uh, we also have a database here for that other research program that I'm interested in, the mental models stuff. We have a database of stroke patients that we work with. So people who've suffered from stroke and have various sorts of injuries to different parts of the brain. And we're just on the cusp now of, using that network to understand boredom as well, because oh. when you think about the consequence of stroke, one of the things that's um, challenging for rehabilitation after the stroke is keeping the patients motivated, keeping them engaged in, also I'm not, not sure how much you know about rehabilitation programs, but they tend to be monotonous and boring, right? So right. it's very hard to keep a, a patient motivated and engaged. And so we're starting to, to look into that as well. In fact, there's a couple of colleagues in engineering across campus who are, who are interested in taking a lot of, using wearable technologies to try and take a lot of metrics of, um, you know, psychophysics to understand what does it look like when someone is engaged in their rehabilitation and what does it look like when they're not engaged? And can we use these real-time measures of, of, of those metrics to sort of say, okay, time to change up the rehab program or time to, to give the person a break and so on. So, so that, that kind of thing is on the, on the horizon as well. Nice. Um, you mentioned it a few times that there are people that are more prone to boredom and people that are less prone to boredom. Um, is, there, is there data around that? Is there a reason why some people are more prone? Is there, 
I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get at, um, is maybe like, uh, there's a, a character traits or a background upbringing. Is there some kind of correlation there? So the background and upbringing thing is much harder to answer. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know of any great data on that. You know, you really need longitudinal studies where you, you capture people when they're eight or nine years of age and you, you follow them through their twenties. We know a little bit about how boredom evolves over, um, uh, over the lifespan so that it sort of ramps up during the teenage years and then around the late teenage, early twenties, it starts to, to drop. And that's, that stage of life is when your, your frontal cortices are starting to mature finally. You know, your brain is not fully matured until your early to mid twenties. Right. So boredom dips around that time and then it drops in the middle decades. And that's sort of obvious in the sense, because in our middle decades, we're too busy to be bored, right? We're raising <laughs> families. We're developing careers, you know, we just don't have any time. And then boredom slightly rises again in our sort of seventh and eighth decades of life. And this is again where free time uh, retirement. A, right. And 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 you know, and, and your social networks change, people start dying. So you know who you're hanging out with now. Um, so we know a little bit about that, but but you're asking and that's the sort of developmental trajectory in some sense, but you're asking about, you know, individual sort of characteristics and things. And so we we don't know a lot about things like, you know, socioeconomic status and, and uh, or we, we don't know a lot about genetics yet, although we have a, a study in the lab where we're looking at that as well. Um, and I can tell you more about that if you're interested. But um, we do know a fair bit about various sort of personality traits that are correlated with boredom. But as all sort of first year psychology students know, correlation does not equal causation. Right, right? So yeah. When you're working in... <coughs> When you're working in individual trait differences, that's what you're working with. You're working with correlations, relationships between variables, and you really can't speak to the causation. So, and you can't also manipulate traits, right? These are sort of things that people come to your experiments with, um, yeah, and, and so you can't really do much about that. Having said that, what are the traits that we know that are associated with boredom proneness? Well, um, neuroticism, so uh, a sort of tendency to be more anxious about the world and more anxious about your life is related to boredom proneness. Um, levels of trait self-control. So your ability to sort of corral your thoughts and actions and emotions, your ability to guide them and keep them in check is if you have a, a strong capacity to, to exert that level of self-control, you tend not to be bored. Um, right. Low okay. self-control, you do tend to be bored. Mm -hmm. And then there's other sorts of things too. I mean, there's a notion of, what's called covert narcissism that is associated with high boredom proneness as well. So the overt narcissist, the sort of Donald Trump, if you like, is the person who kind of, um, you know, just shouts out to the world how wonderful they are, right? And just right. expects the world to know this and the world should, should see that those people don't get bored very often. The really? Covert, no, wow. they don't. So the covert narcissist is the person who sort of secretly believes the, that the world is missing their brilliance. The, the, the world is, is, is failing to recognize just how wonderful they are. And, you know, and, and things would be so much better if the world just sort of understood their skills and talents and how wonderful they were. The covert narcissist tends to get more bored. And so really? what that might be about is, again, this sort of, um, one of the things that we think is really critical to boredom proneness is a sense of agency, right? That you are the master of your own destiny, right? And for the covert narcissist, they feel threatened in that sense. They feel like the world is not allowing them to use their agency in some sense. Now, and how realistic that is, is another question altogether. But at least they're sort of in that, that, that uh, they're in that place where, you know, that they feel like if only things went their way, it'd all be better as though they don't really have control, right? And this mm -hmm. notion of having a strong sense of control is really um, protective against boredom. If you feel like, you know, the direction your life is taking is something that you're having a strong influence on, then you're not likely to be bored. So there's all those kinds of uh, personality traits and, and, and uh, other sort of factors that, that are related to high boredom proneness, but it's really, really hard, if not impossible, to sort of talk about what causes it. Right. Yeah, those are really interesting correlations uh, with boredom, actually. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, well, I'll talk to you maybe about it uh, later, but uh, that's really interesting. Um, the other thing I wanted to know is uh, uh, self-reflection and meditation. People who are, are more able to, uh, like you said, imagination and more able to go into their own minds. Are they able to be less bored because of that? Short answer is yes, right? All right. I mean, so, I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, I, I hesitate to call it a fad, but there seems to be a, 
um, a push over the last decade or so to, to sort of suggest that mindfulness training is the cure to all ills, right? Um, <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't agree with that and I, I don't right. believe that. But certainly people who practice meditation in various ways um, are likely to, to be less susceptible to boredom. Uh-huh. And what they're doing is they're cultivating a practice of engagement. Now, whether or not it's engagement with the external world or when meditating, engagement with your own body states and engagement with your own thought processes isn't really that important. It's just that you're successfully engaging, right? And if you're successfully engaging, then you're not bored. So right. two things can't coexist. Right. One of the things that I think about that is that there's, there's quite a bit of research showing that people who are prone to boredom are also prone to failures of attention. And this can be everyday failures of attention. You know, you get up in the morning and you pour orange juice on your cereal instead of milk. Um, or, you know, I've had that experience where you get in the car and you go driving and you, you, you're meant to go to the corner store, but you find yourself halfway to work. And you're thinking, well, no, I, you know, what, what happened here? Those kind of lapses in attention uh, are more common for people who are highly prone to boredom. Really? I would have thought yeah. the opposite because if you're losing your attention, you're keeping yourself occupied. You're keeping your mind on something else. No, you, you, you're wanting to keep your mind occupied and you're wanting to stay engaged, but you're failing at it. And huh. so um, the model suggests that it's those failures of attention, those failures to engage appropriately, that actually cause boredom. And he's got one paper that, that sort of supports this, but like I say before, it's very hard to, to substantiate that kind of claim. Yeah. But yeah, so, so one of the things I think about that though, and that there are lots of experimental uh, demonstrations of poor attentional performance and high boredom proneness. If you took a person then, if it's because I often get asked to this, uh, usually when I'm doing sort of you know, uh, radio media, what, what can we do to fix boredom? You know, what's the remedy, this kind of stuff. And if you ask people to engage in something like mindfulness meditation, you're essentially asking them to do something using a skill they don't already have, which is probably true for everybody getting into mindfulness training at the start, at the very least. Right. Particularly hard for the boredom prone because what you need to do in mindfulness meditation is concentrate very deeply. <laughs> what boredom proneness can't do is concentrate very deeply. Right. So, in, in some sense, I think mindfulness meditation could be really good for a lot of people, um, it, but it, it's not likely to be the, sol the solution for everybody. And in, in some ways, some solutions that might work, that we'd have no data for yet, um, would sound a little bit counterintuitive, you know? Yeah. Maybe you encourage, if you've got a kid that's, that's in your classroom and he's, he's, you know, clearly bored a lot and clearly struggles to focus attention, maybe you should encourage him to fidget more and just release some of that energy in a physical way. And that takes away maybe some of the mental energy, but the mental distraction that he has and see whether or not that helps him concentrate in the longer term. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So these are various ideas that, that we have. Yeah. It's an important question too. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I found really interesting is that you said people who are prone to boredom, um, it's not like you can cure it with meditation, but it's sort of like a coping mechanism. It's like something they can put their attention on instead. It, yeah. That well, was... there's, another, there's another coping mechanism that people use a lot. And there's a guy called John Alhai, E-L-H-A-I, I think, um, from Toledo, who does really interesting research. And it's, it's all ramping up. I think the first paper I became aware of was 2017, but he's had several papers in the last couple of years. And he's not the only group doing this. So one other remedy to boredom is the internet or your smartphone. <laughs> right. They do this, right? I mean, they, they, they grab the thing that's in their pocket. It has an enormous range of things that you can engage with. Right. But what what uh, Alhai and colleagues are showing is that it can become problematic. And what we would suggest is the reason it's problematic is because it's sort of meaningless connection, right? You, yeah. you, you're bored. And you want to become occupied. You want your mind to be occupied. So you pick up Candy Crush. Or you pick up the ubiquitous sort of cat videos on YouTube. You're occupied. And so you're no longer bored. But at the end of it, you kind of, it's kind of like eating junk food. You know, you, yeah. you sated your hunger, but you don't feel that good about it at the end of it. You know, it yeah, because you're not addressing your boredom head on. You're, you're you know, distracted. You're, yeah, you're not addressing it. You're not dealing with it. You're not growing. Yeah. Absolutely. And so this is not to say that 
everybody who plays Candy Crush or looks at cat videos is, is you know, problematic smartphone users or that they're bored all the time. Right. It's that, it, you know, because I think potentially sometimes it's a perfectly viable solution to being bored. Mm -hmm. If the only solution that you engage in, then I suggest it would probably be, become problematic for you. Um, but yeah, and you know, people listening to podcasts or the kind of thing that, that you're doing, these are things that they can turn to on their smartphone and are engaging because you have to listen to it. You have to engage with the material. It makes you think. So that's fine, right? Right. Um, it's the sort of meaningless engagement uh -huh. that's ultimately not going to work for people. What about um, getting people just to, to accept boredom and deal with boredom in that way? Is, is... Yeah, I, I, so I, the reason why I chuckle a little bit is that I, ultimately I think that that's what we need to do with our children. Like we need to start early on that, right? So the, the kid comes to their parent and they say, I'm bored. What they're really actually saying is I'm bored and I want you to fix it for me. I like, fix right. it now. Give me a solution. And it's probably a reasonable claim for a, a child to make. I mean, we control everything else about their lives. Why not control this, right? But what I think we need to do is to stop the knee-jerk reaction of trying to give them uh, a, an outlet and instead say, oh, well, <laughs> board, figure it out, right? Yeah. Because I think that ultimately um, that, that ought to, to, for most kids, that ought to lead them into doing something productive, creative, you know, useful that, that uh, you know, whatever works for them in, in that moment, they'll, they'll then go to it the next time they feel that sensation and hopefully that kind of works, right? Yeah. Other instances of this, um, so there were sort of natural experiments that the, the New Zealanders did with some of their playgrounds. They, they sort of took most of the playground equipment out and just uh, let their kids play in a sort of just an empty lot or something, you know? Yeah. Um, and it turns out that the kids were really creative about how they were going to engage in play. And learning scores went up, bullying went down, you know, and a whole bunch of really positive outcomes. From wow. just, just, just letting kids figure their own stuff out, right? Um, and I think we could do the same for, for boredom as well. I, you know, I, I think you, your question touches on something that the short answer to is, yeah, we could do with just sitting with it um, more than we do, rather than trying to outrun it, or as I said to you at the start, you know, I, I initially got into this thinking I want to eliminate it because I hate it so much. I now believe there is no eliminating it because it serves a good purpose. It serves a function. Right. So the better approach is not to try and eliminate it, but to recognize the signs when it's coming and figure out your best avenues out of it. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's a really good place to finish, but I don't want to finish just yet because I really want to know the connection um, between uh, the mental model and boredom that you were mentioning earlier. Yeah, so it's about exploration. So boredom is a signal to, that pushes you to act, right? And so um, it's, it's not the only signal to push you to act, but it's one of the signals that pushes you to act. And one of the actions that best satisfies the boredom signal is to explore your environment. Now, if you think about something like berry picking, I don't know if you've ever gone berry picking yourself, but we'd make a balance between exploration and exploitation, right? So you look at a berry patch, you start picking the berries, you don't just pick the berry patch that you're standing in front of dry. You don't pick it till there's nothing left. You pick it until there's a certain point where you're like, my effort isn't worth it here now. I'm going to right. move over here, right? And so you balance those two things. Um, exploration is a, is a massively important signal for mental models as well. So the, the, the notion of a mental model is it's only as successful as its accuracy in predicting the sensory outcomes of our actions. If, it's an, if there's inaccurate predictive coding in our, in our mental model, then we abandon the model and start again, right? Um, uh -huh. And also the mental model also has to be flexible enough to update as things change. It, the example, <coughs> pardon me, the example I'll give you is an experimental one that we did, we published in 2012. We had people play rock, paper, scissors against an, a computer opponent. The computer opponent eventually chose paper 80% of the time. You eventually should pick up on that bias and exploit it, right? So if the computer plays a paper 80%, you should start playing scissors a lot, right? Okay. But you need to be flexible to figure out of where, if the computer changes from paper to rock as a bias. So you need to be able to update when, when your opponent changes. So that's what I mean by updating. The and, mental and, model. Now, the mental model, has, if, if, if the, the concept of predictive coding suggests that the brain is a predictive coding machine and it operates to minimize prediction error. Right. right. So yeah. if, your model, if your model has lots of error in it, then that's a crappy model and you've got to get rid of it. 
it's got to lead- update. It's got to be refined. Right. But this leads to what's known as the dark room problem. If the brain is a predictive machine, then, we, then the best way to predict our world is to crawl up in a ball in the corner of a dark room because everything is now maximally predictive. Right. Okay. Absolutely everything. If I'm crawled up in a corner in a dark room. Right. Because we don't do that, right? <laughs> what happens in that, in that instance is we get bored and then we are prompted uh-huh. to explore. So the, the boredom push to action is important as a definition of boredom and it's important as a component in mental models to push us out of the dark room. Right. right? So, so that's it's the opposite that's... side of the coin. It's the two sides of the coin you're exploring um, and they should be sort of uh, mutually exclusive, I guess. Right. Or, not, or dependent, like... Right. Yeah. Ex- yeah. What do you Usually, call that? There's some really cool stuff coming out of the sort of computational modeling uh, papers of boredom that, that I think relate to the mental model building sort of stuff. So the first was... a. Uh, Ramirez, Gomez, and, and Costa, I think in 2017, and they uh, they actually showed this. They, they they talked about the dark room problem, and they said two things get you out of the dark room problem. First, pleasure seeking. So we do seek things that are pleasurable okay. and interesting. But even if you find something that's pleasurable, if you just did that one pleasurable thing, it would eventually become boring, right? Uh-huh. And boredom was the other thing that pushed you to explore. Right. But then a really cool one that came out recently. Um, and this is you and colleagues in uh, Frontiers. And there's, uh, there's another group of people who've done so, some of these things. You can find it on a YouTube uh, channel called Two Minute Papers. They had these two artificial um, intelligent agents try and learn a maze. And one was driven by curiosity and the other one was driven by boredom. And the boredom agent learned the maze better. Wow. It, it's, it's this notion that boredom is this push to explore your environment mm-hmm. more. Right. So yeah, that theory that you just explained as well, that um, sort of uh, reinforces the data you were talking about before in that um, someone who is able to cope with boredom and deal with boredom is going to be more control, have more self-control and be able to stay in that dark room longer. And so, yeah. Either, either they can stay in the dark room for longer or they just never set foot in it, right? So. There are people, I, I don't know whether or not you have, you've encountered people like this in your life, but there are people who will say, I never get bored. And to them, I, I call bullshit. They <laughs> experience the state boredom signal, but they're just very, very effective and rapid at, at dealing with it, at responding right. to it. They just don't even put a toe in the dark room. They never sit with their boredom. They always right. find something to but, do. But to then they would be on the side of less self-control as well. You might think so, but it depends on how they direct those sorts of actions. So that's entirely um, plausible that someone with low self-control who doesn't, doesn't ever sit with boredom will engage in riskier behaviours, have poor impulse control, will be susceptible to um, drug addiction and alcohol abuse. And that's actually true. We see that in the data, right? The people, some people with low self-control and high boredom proneness are susceptible to all of those kinds of problems. But then you can find individuals who actually just direct their their behavior in productive way. So um, I had a conversation a couple of years ago with um, Chris Hadfield, the guy that used to be the, the commander of the International Space Station. And he's one of these guys that says, I never get bored, doesn't happen. <laughs> but if you talk to him, he, he I, I, I would suggest that if you talk to him for long enough, you hear that he perceives the boredom signal, but just very rapidly and very quickly gets engaged in something else. Yeah. Right? So, um, and the something else that he gets engaged in is not drug abuse and alcohol abuse. It's, you know, becoming an astronaut and, and leading a space station. So, right, yeah. um, or, or spending his time writing songs with bare naked ladies or, 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 you know, getting on the Twitterverse and, and, and making a name for himself that way. So, yes, it, that, that then raises a really important question. If there are these people who just never get bored and some go to impulse control sort of issues and, and risky behaviours and behaviours that are ultimately not good for their health and others who direct it well, what's the difference between them? And how can we do, distinguish between them? Uh, yeah, it sounds like it's the same type of personality traits. It's just they know how to direct them differently. They direct them positively or negatively, yeah. Yeah, possibly, but we, yeah. we don't really know that yet. Interesting. Okay, wow, thank you very much, uh, Dr. James Dankert. Very, um, yeah, big pleasure to have you here. Um, do you have anything that you want to promote, that, um, maybe for people to check out if they want to know more, or well, uh, a YouTube channel or something? 
Uh, I don't have a YouTube channel, but uh, in spring of 2020, my colleague John Eastwood and I do have a book coming out that will be titled Out of My Skull, The Psychology of Boredom. So if people are interested in learning more about it, then they can, uh, they can wait for that book to come out in, uh, in spring 2020. Great. Um, and if you have a website or something, we'll put it in the description for people to look more. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. The, the website is associated with the University of Waterloo at the moment is, is uh, average. I'm, I'm in the process of trying to improve it, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Great. Well, yeah, good luck with everything. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. Have a good one.